Hello class, I'm back. Uh, this is lecture number eight for History 101. And where we left off uh, last time was the decisive victory at Saratoga in uh, October of 1777. And we had summed up how Saratoga was the turning point of the war and uh, how uh, Benjamin Franklin was able to convince the French to back the United States after that decisive victory. So, we want to wrap up the war today, but there's one thing I want to clear up that'll make Saratoga make a heck of a lot of more sense, and also uh, what happens to uh, Benedict Arnold. Now, when you watch that video on Saratoga that I downloaded, and it's vital that you watch that, uh, you'll see that there's some tension between General Gates, who has been given command of the Northern Armies of the Continental Army. That command had been taken away from General Philip Schuyler, uh, because of the debacle at Fort Ty and Mount Independence, General Arthur Sinclair was under his command and he sort of took the heat for it. Now, General Gates was quite a character. His men didn't really like him. He was pretty indecisive and moved very slowly. And a lot of his men referred to him as, quote unquote, Granny Gates. Gates was uh, all full of himself, and he thought he should be the commander of the Continental Army, not George Washington. So there was a lot of behind-the-scenes political fighting between Gates and Washington, putting pressure on the Continental Congress. And uh, Washington obviously had his core of very loyal officers uh including Benedict Arnold. Now, also one of his top officers, and he held a position of aide to camp, was no one other than Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was a young officer. Washington took him under his wing, and uh, he was his so-called aide to camp, his most trusted advisor. Washington sent Hamilton North after Saratoga to gather several regiments of men that he needed to join him down in Pennsylvania where the British were chasing him around the countryside. He had specific men in mind, including uh, Colonel Daniel Morgan and his riflemen. So Hamilton delivers the orders to General Gates. Gates wanting to see Washington fail, tries to pass off some uh, less effective regiments and send them to join Washington. Hamilton knew this might happen and corrected the general and said, reread the orders. General Washington is very specific about who he wants to accompany back down to Pennsylvania. I want those men and I won't leave without them. Hamilton prevailed. Now, here's another little side story on Alexander Hamilton. General Philip Schuyler, that Schuylerville is named after today, which was the village of Saratoga during the uh, war, Alexander Hamilton will end up marrying one of General Philip Schuyler's daughters. So there's that connection also. Now, back to Benedict Arnold. After Arnold heals from his second gunshot wound to his leg, and I told you how that gave him a permanent limp, and in all likelihood, he probably should have had it amputated, he will be given his next command by General Washington. He will be put in charge of the city of Philadelphia. Now, that might sound more impressive than it is. Basically, what it amounts to is a desk job. And Arnold isn't happy. He's a battlefield general. But Washington wants to provide him with enough time 
to heal from his wounds. Plus, General Gates has given some less than flattering reports about Arnold's actions at Saratoga, uh, trying to downplay his importance and give it an all to himself. And as we know, Arnold was the hero on the battlefield. Gates sat way behind enemy lines in the Nielsen house quite safely during all these battles. Now, Arnold goes to Philadelphia, hates his job, it's a desk job, but he's going to end up meeting uh, and falling in love with his wife, a woman by the name of Peggy Shippen. Peggy Shippen is the daughter of a very wealthy Philadelphia politician and physician. Uh, also, unfortunately, Shippen's family are loyalists. And this is where Arnold, for the very first time, is going to meet the British spy, Major Andre, at the Shippen family dinner table. So Arnold ends up marrying Peggy Shippen. She's a very beautiful, wealthy young lady. And Arnold's going to be kind of in a predicament. The uh, Continental Army has not been paying their officers. They don't have much money. They're paying their enlisted men to keep them fighting and basically giving the officers IOUs. So Arnold's basically broke. And he ends up with a very attractive young wife who historians would argue has champagne tastes from her background. And poor Arnold is on a Genesee beer salary. So, the Arnold keeps bugging Washington for a change of command, and he'll be given that, he'll be given command of West Point. Now, at this point in history, West Point is not the military academy it is today. It's a very strategic military spot on the Hudson River. If you've ever been to West Point, you know that the river narrows and bends right at West Point. And this allows the Americans to build this huge chain, iron chain, with links this big around or larger. There's a part of that chain at the state capitol in Albany that you may have seen before. <clears throat> that chain stretches across the Hudson River. And the reason why they do this, it will prevent any British ships from traveling north beyond there. They cannot make it through that chain. It'll smash their wooden hulls. Plus, they have <clears throat> armaments on both sides of the river. On the east side of the river, across from uh, West Point, where it is today, <coughs> excuse me, is Fort Clinton. So... Arnold is given command of the West Point military complex to basically guard the chain. It's better than a desk job in Philadelphia, but it's not exactly the battlefield assignment that he wants. But the Continental Congress is refusing to let Washington give him that. So Arnold and his wife Peggy Shippen are living up in West Point, New York. Now, this is when the British spy, Major Andre, who uh, Arnold met at the ship and family dinner table, approaches Arnold and offers him 25,000 pounds British sterling for the plans to West Point so that the British can sneak in, easily take it over, cut the chain, and allow the British Navy to sail north towards Albany. <clears throat> Arnold agrees to this, and this is how he becomes a traitor to his country. Now, I don't want to make excuses for Arnold, but Arnold's in a position he doesn't like. He's been overlooked for promotions. He hasn't been paid in a long time, and he's desperate. Doesn't justify it, but that's the circumstances. So, 
Andre gets the plans. He's traveling back down to New York City to deliver it to his commanders. And he stopped in a routine stop along what is uh, Route 9 today that runs along the Hudson by some American militia sentries. The sentries are suspicious of him, search his saddlebags, and find the plans. So the whole plot is revealed that way. Now, it's still unclear to this day if these militia guys were really acting as sentries or they were robbing Andre. If they were, they didn't admit that when they turned over the plans. So once that happens, the plot's unfoiled. That's Arnold's demise. Arnold will have to flee behind British lines when he discovers that he has been discovered and will become a general in the British military. He'll never really see much combat because the British really don't trust him either. And unfortunately, he'll end up living in London after the war, and that's where he'll ultimately uh, die in June of 1801, and he's buried in London. So that's the sad saga of hero Benedict Arnold turned traitor in uh, September of 1780. So what we want to carry on with next is to complete the war. And if you look on page 153 in your textbook, you'll notice that we have another map that shows, map 7.2, that shows war in the South, 1780 to 1781. Now, one thing you'll notice on this map, there are also uh, some French names as far as American movements in the war. <clears throat> you'll notice that in August of 1781, General Washington and General Rochambeau, a French general commanding French troops attached to Washington, thanks to Franklin and Saratoga, will march south out of Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, New York, on the Hudson, north of West Point. They will march south with their destination ultimately being the Battle of Yorktown. General Lafayette, another French general, will come from the interior of Virginia with French troops that you can notice there. And Admiral de Grasse will sail up from the French West Indies with a French naval force to support Lafayette, Washington, and Rochambeau at Yorktown. <clears throat> that is where General Washington will defeat British General Cornwallis. And that is, for all intents and purposes, the end of the Revolutionary War. It ends in October of 1781, when Cornwallis surrenders to Washington. <clears throat> now, I know sometimes it's confusing because you'll see where sometimes they'll say the Revolutionary War ends in 1783. That's when the very complex Treaty of Paris between the British and uh, the brand new United States is signed. <clears throat> That's a very delicate process that takes almost a year and a half to reach because it's complicated to take the 13 British colonies, now make them independent, uh, an independent nation, uh, to determine uh, any sort of debts owed to the British, what the actual geographic map of the United States is going to look like after the war. And uh, there are a lot of details in the Treaty of Paris of 1783. And that's why uh, you can see these confusing dates. For all intents and purposes, the war ended in 1781. The actual peace treaty wasn't signed until 1783. <clears throat> but to reinforce the idea that the United States is up and running in 1781, that's when 
we create our very first form of government in the United States. The Articles of Confederation are agreed to by the now, excuse me, 13 states that had previously been colonies, and the United States is up and functioning. The actual details are not worked out till 1783 as far as us and the British are concerned. Now, if you take a look on page 165, that shows us a map of the brand new United States as defined by the Treaty of Paris of 1783. And you'll notice we have the 13 states along the eastern seaboard. <clears throat> and much of the United States also now goes to the interior all the way to the Mississippi River. But you'll also notice Florida and the Atlantic coastlines of both Mississippi and Alabama are still controlled by the Spanish. They were Spanish territory. And Canada is still controlled by the British. It's British Canada. And British Canada will become pretty important because a lot of American loyalists from the 13 colonies, now 13 states, after the war ends, will flee to Canada. And they'll settle in what's known as Upper Canada at the time, which turns into the province of Ontario, because that's where the British capital of Canada is, in a place called York, that later will become Toronto, Ontario. Uh, lower Canada, and they call it Upper and Lower in relationship to the St. Lawrence River, is basically French Canada under British control with its capital city of Quebec. So you have Upper Canada with the British capital of York, you have Lower Canada uh, with the capital Quebec. Now, the United States will be up and running under a very short-lived government, the Articles of Confederation. They'll only last from 1781 until 1788. They will be a failed system of government that is loosely organized and makes states much more powerful than the federal government, and it'll end up being an outright failure. Uh, that's why in 1787, the founding fathers will gather in Philadelphia at what will end up becoming known as the Constitutional Convention to write the Constitution to replace the Articles of Confederation, this very short-lived government that lasted from 1781 till 1788. Now, I just want to point out four major problems with the Articles of Confederation. As I mentioned before, it's sort of like a government that's flip-flopped with the states having all the power and the federal government being very weak. Federal government did not have any power to tax, and the states did. The federal government relied on the states for all their funding, and the states were basically broke after the war, so the federal government had to operate on a shoestring. Another big problem with the Articles of Confederation was interstate commerce, trade between states. It was regulated by the states. So the states collected tariffs from items coming from Europe, and that was their major source of revenue, but they also could place tariffs on state-to-state -state transactions. So <clears throat> Pennsylvania could charge tariffs on items entering its state from the state of New York and vice versa. <clears throat> this was a mess. Then finally... There was a currency crisis. Every state had its own form of currency. And so did 
the federal government. So it meant we had 14 forms of money in the brand new country, all with fluctuating values. Now, <clears throat> Virginia's currency, because that state was the largest populated, had the thriving economy of tobacco, was the most valuable. Money printed in Massachusetts was almost worthless because they were in so much debt. <clears throat> and a lot of people refused to accept any American printed currency and would only accept British pounds sterling as payment or French francs because they were much more stable. <clears throat> now, one final underlying problem with the Articles of Confederation was payment of the Revolutionary War bonds. Bonds we started issuing back in 1775 and issued through the course of the war to pay for it. Now, all of a sudden, these bonds are going to come due and the federal government doesn't have the funds to pay them. <clears throat> it's going to create a bond crisis, which will really be the motivating factor that leads to the Constitutional Convention. So, next lecture, I'm going to talk to you about <clears throat> a couple of important things that happened before the Constitutional Convention. The Annapolis Convention of 1786 and Shays' Rebellion. So, that's it for today. Uh, everybody take care. See you next time. I'll come back to the library in a few days to record some more lectures. Be safe. Enjoy the nice weather out there. Take care.